Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Thank you for joining this GP Strategies webinar, where we'll explore best practices and innovative insights to help you and your organization improve performance. What are we talking about? It's modern digital learning design today. What does it take to get to success? And we've just got myself and Ben today uh, on this session. Ben, are you able to move the slide? Um, so myself, Oliver, I'm usually based in Singapore. I'm our director of client engagement. I look after our client relationships for Singapore, Southeast Asia, and and focus a lot really on the leadership employee engagement space, but also digital uh, has become really, really important for me over the last two to three to five years. And Ben, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, so I look after our Asia Pacific learning solutions. I'm based in Sydney, Australia. Um, for those of you who've been to our recent webinars, you'll be familiar with Oliver and I. Um, yeah, I, I work with our team and our clients to make sure that um, you know, we're building innovative solutions that actually work in the learning space. And that's kind of the genesis of why we're here today. Brilliant. And so um, what are we here to talk about today? So we're going to run through common roadblocks, uh, things that really get in the way when we're talking about digital design and things that you can mitigate in your organization. Critical success factors, which many of you will be familiar with. We talk about these things uh, on every session. It's so vital. And so, Ben, shall I hand over to you for this? Yeah, look, guys, as usual. So, hi, everyone. Hopefully, you can see the, the video. And, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're here and you're active, say hello in the chat, too. I'm just going to write hello myself. If you haven't said hello yet, just make sure you know where the chat is. Um, I'm really excited to have everybody here because today's session, um, a few sessions ago, we, we ran a kind of zoomed out look at digital learning transformation as a whole. Hi, everyone. I can see those hellos coming in. And we did a poll at the end of that webinar where we asked, what do you want to focus in on next out of the three critical decision areas, technology, design process, and, um, and learner engagement? And learner engagement won by a hair, so our last webinar, um, if you want to get a recording for it, we can. That was on how to drive adoption and learning engagement. This one was second by a nose, uh, second just by a hair. And it was all about how do we design. And for us, to be honest, digital learning design is, it's the, it's the art of it, it's the essence of it. Without doing this well, it's very, very, very hard to achieve really good outcomes. But first, we need to get aligned on what we mean by digital learning. You know, I've already had some folks, was it George, who mentioned that they're furiously converting instructor-led trainings to digital um, you know, so, so look, digital has many formats. Yes, it might include going from instructor-led training to virtual instructor-led training. Um, it might include e-learning, but just to, uh, and if you've been on these webinars, you've heard this before. For, for my team, for GP Strategies, what modern digital learning means is a, a platform or a series of platforms or technologies that bring all of the modalities including live and traditional modalities such as classroom or on-the-job coaching, face-to-face -face elements. It brings all of those modalities and more that are possible together into a continuous stream of learning. All right, so, so what, what digital is creating the opportunity for is moving from event-based learning, where you had an event and then that was it, to a continuous stream of learning where, where learning is a part of my job. And that's what our definition of digital is. And I want to call out here straight away that, you know, not all learning interventions or digital learning strategies include all modalities. And what we'll learn about in the design process today is how you decide what are we going to do, how are we going to do it, and most importantly, how are we going to make sure it's successful. So remember, some key dimensions or some key components of modern digital learning is that it usually involves micro learning because we want to respect people's time. It, it's normally, it has to be relevant. It's normally self-led, right? So there might be facilitator-led elements or coach-led elements, but generally speaking, the whole stream is driven by the learner and supported by others. Should be easy to access, easy to consume, social, curated, continuous, diverse, and fun because if it's just the same thing over and over again, it's monotonous. You don't get people coming back. It should be sticky, should be supported by people, and it should be pervasive, meaning it should be a fixed part.
part of my job cycle rather than an event that I'm told to, to attend at a key time. And there's lots of benefits that we've discussed over the last few webinars, you know, that if, if done right, that it'll increase the overall effectiveness of all of your learning by binding them together and increasing retention. It'll respect people's time. You know, we're doing a lot of work right now in the banking space, in the automotive space, and, you know, pharmaceutical space where people are out there selling to doctors, you know, and people don't want to be off the job for very long. So respecting people's time, minimizing disruption from workflow is critical, right? Not irrespective of digital. That's what learners want. That's what businesses want. Um, you can increase the chance of long-term success and retention through stretching the experience out rather than hitting people with a fire hose. Um, you can be, because of the nature of many digital platforms, you're getting a lot of data, which is down the bottom there, and, it, and, and you can be more agile and responsive, both in terms of what's happening in the learning environment, but also what's happening in your business, right? Modern uh, approaches to learning and, and are much more responsive and quicker to embed new and current changes in learning into that learning stream. You can reach wider populations without diminishing the effectiveness and, and also generally it's, it's better to, to measure ROI. Um, so they're the benefits, right? But, but it is a challenge to get to what good looks like. And so what I'm gonna start with is some common kind of quotes that we hear from our partners around the world when we're engaging in this. And I'm gonna be kind of pretty brutally straightforward with some of these, right? Um, so, you know, in the buying process, a common expression we hear is, show me exactly what the solution will look like now, please, right? Definitely the please comes later, but because what's going on here is that people are used to kind of getting what the solution looks like upfront. When I buy classroom training, Right? I might go and I, I reach out to GP or any other vendor and I buy a two-day presentation skills learning or I buy a two-day sales skills learning or whatever it might be. Typically, you have an agenda. You know what's happening in the morning. You know what's happening in the afternoon. Even with e-learning, you might get a storyboard or something up front. But modern learning like this, often because it's, 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 there's so many different layers to make it very successful, um, that showing you what it looks like is not always easy, right? And so you end up buying the process to get to what good looks like rather than the actual end solution itself. That's a huge challenge. Another one we hear is, okay, yeah, I get it. I hear what you're saying. We like it, but can you please skip one, skip steps one, three, and five? We don't need that, right? Maybe that's budgetary. Maybe it's because they don't really get it. But a lack of understanding of how critical the steps are means that people want to cut corners and jump steps because, oh, we've already done that, or we've already done that, you know. But in what we often find is that it hasn't been done, or it hasn't been done at a, a great enough depth to ensure success. Here's a couple of others. It's interesting, but it'll never work here, right? That's probably one of the most common ones I hear is, oh, yeah, so, so Ben, you've shown me how it worked at X company, X company, even the same, comp same type of industry, the same country, the same culture, and we still kind of, there's a paranoia that that's not what it's like at our business, so it'll never fly here, or it's too soon for us. Well, we're gonna talk about how that's not necessarily true, uh, and that there's fears and concerns driving that that need to be overcome through the design process. Um, you know, people who come to us who are already on the journey, right? We've invested in LinkedIn Learning, or we've got some other platform. Yeah, we know that engagement is low, so can you please fix it? But we're still not gonna prepare to change anything that we're already doing. That's another common one that we get. Can you do everything you just described, but can you do it off the shelf, right? So modern digital transformation content that goes into a digital experience may be off the shelf, but the process, again, to build the ecosystem, to build the experience is rarely off the shelf. Um, in fact, as we'll learn later, that off the shelf is kind of contrary to what you need to make a good self-led digital experience. Why does it cost so much? We've already got a course and you're just converting it is another one that we get. Well, and, and, and you know, the, look, we'll talk about that one especially, but the reality is, is, is you're not just, it's not just a straight conversion like it might have been. Even classroom to, VR, to virtual classroom is a straighter conversion than going to a fully self-led blended experience. Um, there's so many platforms and so much, so much content out there. You know, help us cut through the noise. You know, these are the common things that we hear, and there's a whole bunch more that we hear, and a lot of that is driven for a number of fears. We've mentioned these fears in previous webinars, right? That people are worried that no one will turn up, that it's gonna be a wasted investment, that the learning itself won't hit the mark. But they're also worried about some other things as well, right? And, and, and it's not so much that we're worried to it, it's that it's an unknown. You know, what's happening is that 
the learning landscape has changed. Right? And so what I want to do here very quickly is hear from you guys. So there's a text typing tool. It's a little T. I want you to grab that. Don't pick the color yellow. Yellow might be the default. Pick any other color but yellow. Um, and type on the screen, what are some key ways in which learning has changed? You know, so what I'm doing is I'm comparing maybe where I was previously buying classroom training or developing classroom training or even e-learning, and now I'm building something maybe uh, the, uh, more akin to what I was describing at the top of this webinar. So I want to type on the screen and highlight what are some of the key ways that learning has changed, the way that people are buying. Upskilling needs to be fast and intuitive, yeah, because new skills are being required. Automation is changing what we need from our people. There's so many things that are changing. Products are hitting faster. Competition is moving quicker. Totally agree. Yeah, it needs to be on demand. Yeah, users have shorter attention span. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'd say the, I'm going to put it more diplomatically. The work demands more attention than the learning. Uh, so. Short, it has to be short and sweet, free content available online. That's what some people are looking for. Um, and also there's a lot of content out there. You can't take time off work. Yeah, the work cannot be hampered for learning. I totally agree. Um, digital platforms have compelled people to accept technology. You know, and I would suggest that, you know, a lot of companies kind of say, our oh, people aren't ready for this. But in reality, is a lot of what you're describing, people are already doing in their daily work. It's got to be very relevant. It's got to be directly work-related. Yeah, there's so much stuff available online. People need curation rather than lectures. Yeah, and curation, there's an art to that. So I think there's a lot of good comments coming up there. I'll wait another minute, see if anyone else has anything. Too much to choose from, how to cut through the noise. Thank you, yes, I was calling that one out earlier. Yeah, the learning landscape has changed. Yeah, recognition of different learning styles. Yeah, that's becoming more relevant than ever. You can't just rely on a facilitator to navigate the classroom environment. You know, you need to be able to build that into the design up front where it's a self-led experience. So thank you guys. You don't need to type anything else on here. I'm going to move slides. But I'm going to try to put all of that into a nutshell. The biggest change we see in, in, in learning is that in the good old days, um, you know, there was more of a, a content focus or, or maybe a modality-centric focus. Even though people would say they were learner-centric or experience-centric, in reality, we weren't typically content-centric. So, you know, a, 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 one of our partners would come to me and say, we want, we've done a needs analysis, and what's come up is that people need to learn change management skills, or people need to learn delegation skills, or people need to improve on this product, or people need to, you know, be onboarded into the company. We need to show them these HR skills, or I need these people trained in these technical skills. Right, and so then that goes into the center, and then you go out and people go and vet vendors based on that. They go and assess um, the fit of the solution based on that. You know, and, and really what's changing is if you're gonna go out and vet vendors based on their content, but you're not looking at their capacity to actually ch deal with change management, to actually reach the learners that you want, to at attack the geographies, to hit the scalability, then you're gonna face some of those kind of questions that we addressed earlier, right? If you don't understand that it's no longer content alone that you're focusing on, it's actually the experience that you're focusing on, then you're gonna have some of those challenges. So for us, that's like the biggest gap here is, as soon as you start to realize that it's a learner experience we're building for, then some of those questions start to go away. But even knowing that it's an experience design that we're shooting for, understanding what goes into that design is, the other big gap. So until I really understand what it takes to build what good looks like, to make something successful, then I'm still going to have some of those worries. I'm still going to have some of those those patterns, those old bat buying patterns that perhaps help that lead to me to make poor buying decisions, right? Um, so we've spoken about some core critical decisions in a previous webinar, right? You need to, when you're kind of deciding on going digital, you need to decide the what, when, and why of what type of technology. When are we going to make the decision on the technology and why are we choosing that technology? The same about the learning design and the same about learner engagement. We've addressed those others in previous webinar. Today, we're focusing in on critical design decisions. And so design sits above everything. Well-designed programs influence the modality or the platform. It influences the content and it influences the, the way we engage learners. Um, and the reason why that's so critical is, again, I want to zoom in on these elements because it's self-led, because it's continuous, because it's micro, because it's pervasive, 
you can't rely on a facilitator or someone to push them through it, right? The learner has to want to participate. So with that in mind, here's my next chat question for you guys. So in the chat, with this in mind, what in your opinion are the critical ingredients to successful design of modern digital experiences? Just try to, don't hit me a million at once, just hit me with a few. Go into the chat and type that in there and we'll look at what you're coming up with. I'm gonna wait a minute. Obviously it takes a second for people to form their ideas. Long end connection. Internet connection. Yeah, yeah. Very fair. <laughs> and that's one of the things that you need to acknowledge. So I would say a good, good digital design is analyzing infrastructure and IT limitations, right? So absolutely. Yeah, how are we gonna engage that it's gonna be bite-sized, that there's to be ruthless relevance. Thank you, Adrian. It's gotta be interactive. Um, yeah, a series of, or a mix of blended learning activities. Yeah, what's the experience like for the learner? It's got to produce results. Absolutely, it's kind and of risk the time. Yeah, <laughs> and and how do you how do you know that it produces results, right? Yeah, hyper relevancy. I'm, I love that relevancy is coming up so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, bite size, key takeaways. Um, focus more on the learning. Um, Radia, could you tell us a bit? Oh, then the viewing. Yeah, absolutely. So, making sure that the learning is right on the experiential. Yeah, look, I think these are the ingredients of a good program, right? And I'm hearing some elements uh, around good design. Can I push a little bit further, guys? And what goes into the design process that makes this successful? So there are some good elements here, right? We've got to think about the learner, that we've got to be thinking micro and blended. What else goes into the design process? What are the ingredients of good design? Can you go a bit deeper, guys? I'm going to push you. Simplified design. Um, simplified experience content. I, I don't know if the design has become some more simplified. Um, yeah, it's got to address learners. Yeah, it can't be too complicated. Totally agree. It's got to be a process that people can all jump into, right? Even if they aren't familiar with that design process. Um, yeah, it's got to consider emotions and, and intention of what we're trying to create. Thank you, Manesh. That's a really good one, mate. Um, nice to see you. Uh, what can the learner take back into the workplace? Understanding what the learner needs. Look, I think we're on the same page here, so I'm going to jump ahead. And I'm going to start off with a few things. Our critical success criteria, you've heard me say these before. Central to design and also central to your measurement if, if you're doing something effectively in the digital space. is, is it, Has it been ruthlessly relevant? Have I found a way to create connections to both people and the content? Am I doing it in a way that's respecting people's time? Am I generating pool? And am I, have I built in mechanisms to collect data that we're being successful? So these are not necessarily the design process, but these are the criteria that I am designing towards, right? So these are some of the things that you mentioned earlier. So just take a photo of that with your phone. We're gonna send you obviously a recording, but you know, this is central to it. And I often, when a client says, yes, you can get access to past webinars, uh, Catherine will find a way to get them to you. We'll, maybe we'll email you just quick access links for you, okay? So we can take a flag of that for the team. But um, yeah, I'll do that then. You know, these critical success criteria, we've often used these, just these simple five steps when a client's saying, hey, Ben, we've got LinkedIn learning and success factors, and we don't know why no one's turning up to LinkedIn learning. What's going on with that? So we'll go in and we'll kind of go, oh, look, we have a more detailed analysis tool, but just simply, is this content relevant? How are learners being connected to each other and to the content? Does this learning respect learner's time? And how do you know how much time learners have? You know, we go through this process and it's an immediate validation to say, okay, I get it. Yeah, I can see why there's some gaps here. So it's a way to validate what you're already doing, what's happened, what's working and what's not working. But it's certainly a mechanism or a series of criteria that you should be building towards. How do you build towards that? Well, let's go through the mindset that, that I, this is from my own mind, right? So I haven't necessarily, this is from our experience working in this space over the last four years, especially. I mean, we've been in e-learning and virtual learning for a long time, decades, but, but now I'm just focusing in on modern digital learning. So it's gotta be learner and business centric, right? So the learner goes in the middle, but it's not just learner centric, it's gotta be business centric. And I'm gonna explain more about that later. You've gotta follow the success criteria and you have to trust the process. So I've got to, first of all, f make sure I'm building towards this success cr cr criteria. I've got to respect that. And then I've got to trust the process. You know, a mantra that we often have in the design process, because it's so new for a lot of organizations is, we just say, look, trust the process, because what they're used to is a gated, 
waterfall process, which is here is the design spec, here is the storyboard, here is the alpha, the beta. You know, you're kind of building towards something you spec'd out at the beginning. Whereas in this agile development process, you're, you're getting to what good looks like progressively as a team. So it can feel uncomfortable for a team that isn't used to that. So you have to trust the process and trust whether it's GP or some other vendor, trust that vendor if they've if they've explained the process to you well, trust that you're going to move through it together. Um, the next part is that it's fully hands-on. It's full contact, right? We have hackathons. You know, you're getting in there, you're moving post-it notes around, you're validating ideas as you go, because what you don't want to do is design something in a vacuum, launch it, and then it falls on its face, right? So it's full contact, it's hands-on, it's user testing, it's collaborative, it's, it's agile. This is going to be something that I hope you guys really value from this webinar. We're going to talk about the power of integrating measurement into the design process. Now. Um, you know, measurement is often something that clients, if you read an RFP from one of our partners, it'll be like, must have a level one through to level four Kirkpatrick measurement scale. But then you actually go to do it and the client often doesn't have the desire to invest what's required to, or give access to what's required to achieve that measurement. So we're going to talk to you today about how measurement built into early in the design process helps drive a successful learning outcome, not just successful measurement in the back end. Um, it's agile, not gated and waterfall, meaning I already kind of addressed that. You've got to be prepared to test, test, test as you go and adapt. We've had development projects that, you know, three weeks into or four weeks into it, we've blown it up and started again because some new piece came out, right? And that's okay because that's the process, right? You're starting off with big circles and moving into progressively smaller and smaller circles until you get to what good looks like. That is the process. And it continues after you've launched. Right? You should, because it's a stream of learning we're going for, we're constantly reading the data and we're constantly testing and measuring and we're constantly adapting. Um, it's got to be flexible. You know, if you're coming into this saying, hey, we want to have this fully engaging experience and, and we want it to, have, we want to hit 500 people and we want it to be like this, but you know what, you have to use this content and this technology and we're not going to be flexible on it. You know, that's why earlier on I spoke about it's what, it's not just what decisions you make, but when you make them. Right? If you've already gone in and you've kind of made decisions about a technology before thinking about what your business needs and what your learners need, then that can put serious limitations on any partner's ability to support you. Um, and, and look, we do often, one of, one of the things we talk about as GPs, we will come in and help you get the most from your current ecosystem. You know, we work with a large global health insurer who had started off with success factors then they deployed Degreed, and then now they've added in a platform called Centrical, right? And so we've worked with them throughout that to help them figure out how do we actually, and LinkedIn Learning is a part of that puzzle too, how do we actually bring that together as an ecosystem, right? But there has to be a flexibility that, you know what? Some technology or some content just aren't going to cut the bill by themselves. We need to do more. And finally, and this is really important, and this helps to address some of those concerns of our company's not ready for this, our people aren't ready for this, you have to design from the start with change management and engagement in mind. So if I, and I'll show you an example in a moment, but if I know for a fact that upfront going in, this is brand new for our business. If I know for a fact that traditionally in this company, learning has been top down and prescriptive. And in fact, the only learning people have had access to is mandatory learning, right? Maybe I'm hitting my individual contributor population. If I know that, right, it doesn't mean that those people, those individual contributors aren't ever going to accept this type of learning. The reality is they're already learning like this in their own time. They're looking up YouTube, they're getting learning when they need it. All that means is they need to, we need to build a change process to help them realize, hey, you know what? That's also how we're going to start learning in this company. So, so these are what I would say, I hope that all of our clients and also our own internal GP folks, the mindset that we have going into every project of this nature. I will recognize that not every partner. You, I might have my key learning partners on this frame of mind, but the stakeholders out there in the business, maybe they aren't there yet. So we even build in education sessions and bring in non-related stakeholders, like who aren't related to the design process, into the hackathon, for example, so they can get what we're trying to do here, right? Because that helps later with buy-in and support. So, so these are the critical design mindset. Another photo with the phone is what I'd recommend. But let's jump in further into the critical design decisions, right? I've spoken about modalities and platforms. We've spoken about learning content and learner engagement. We're going to break that down. 
How do we get there? Well, it starts with putting your business in the center, its goals, its culture, its current culture, and its future desired culture. And I don't mean business culture. I mean, I partly mean that, but I also mean the learning culture. What is the learning culture today? Be honest and respectful about where you are today. But then look at what is the culture? What learning culture does your business need? And that feeds back into the business culture, right? We do, all, like I mentioned, banks, huge disruption, huge impacts from automation, huge pressure from, from rapidly moving competitors in the fintech space, right? They need people who are ready and adaptable to change. They need people who are going to learn on the fly, who can reskill and cross-skill because there's going to be a talent shortage of emerging skills by 2030, right? So if I know my company is heading in that direction, then that then informs what type of learning culture I need, and then that then informs what decisions I'm making with this immediate learning project, right? And then, of course, the learners. So really, the process here is a learning-centric design, but I want you to also put in the word business-centric design. And the main methodology we use, and people say, oh, design thinking, not again design thinking, but design thinking is, for my mind, the only way to get to what good looks like. Now, design thinking has a lot of versions, right? There is design thinking that you use. The primary tool for design thinking or use case is when there's a problem that we haven't even yet defined yet. We also use design thinking as a process to move through a hard and fast design and development project, right? So design thinking is broken down into a series of steps, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. But as I pointed out earlier, that this isn't a traditional gated linear process. This is an agile process with testing and prototyping and drafting, you know, and so that means the design thinking process is nonlinear. It's an agile design thinking process. So that is GP's primary mechanism. And we do, we go in deep on it. We're very complex projects. We're working with a large bank in China right now for their entire ecosystem, right? So not just one learning experience or one learning curriculum, but an entire ecosystem, all the way down to a single learning experience for, for 10,000 or 1,000 individual contributors will go through this process. And I'll, now I'll explain why. So it looks something like this, right? There's definitely some empathizing up front, understanding the business, the culture, the learners. There's a lot of defining, right? That's a collaborative that might happen in the hackathon where we start to kind of bring that analysis, bring the analysis from the empathizing phase and start to, you know, what are our success criteria? What are the parameters? What are our limitations? What do we need to focus on? What are the must-haves? Um, what are our measurement criteria? You move into the ID8 phase, right? Again, this is kind of an extension of the hackathon. Let's actually prototype and start building out ideas. But as we're doing this, we are validating that against what we've defined and empathized on earlier. All right? So we're saying, you know, I'll jump into it in a minute, actually. But the majority of the actual development process revolves in the building and testing, right? Let's build it. Let's test it. Let's get learner. Uh, let's get learner feedback. Let's get user feedback. Let's do this. Let's get those circles smaller and smaller. And then when we pilot, we're still testing, right? And then we move forward like that. So that's a nutshell of our development process. But I want to break down a few elements into these different categories. So empathizing, learner personas, right? So we would normally go through and we will go through a series of interviews. Right here are real interviews from a large global automotive manufacturer. We'll go through interviews. We'll start to narrow down those interviews into different categories, right? Once we've, we'll consolidate that data into, you know, who am I? What are my motivations and goals? What are some key quotes from those learners? What are their friction points? This is not a needs analysis, although needs may come up, right? It's, it's not necessarily the primary focus. Needs are a part of it, but they're not all of it, right? So all of that feeds into these learner personas. So I consider these learner personas to be like a compass. They're the north, east, south, and west. Of, um, of, the, of any given learner population. You might have four, you might have six, you might have eight learner personas. For a large bank we did this with, the learner personas consisted of revenue generating and non-revenue generating, and then junior and senior, right? And so that was what they narrowed it down to. For a population of something like, you know, I think it was 10,000 learners. Um, and so what we do is we build these early in the stage. And so as we're later on, we'll talk about prototyping and ideating and defining, we're doing all of that with these learners in mind. But beyond learner personas, you're also building your business map, right? So let me ask you a question. Here's another chat to get you guys engaged. Uh, do we have a session on creating learner personas? I don't run a webinar on that. Creation of learner personas in the interview process is a complex process. We do have a half day sessions and virtual sessions on the design thinking process. 
um, which we can share. And I think we have a design thinking microsite which we can share with you guys too, where you can try to watch some videos and whatnot. But we offer courses on it and also some public sessions. So yes, it's not part of this current webinar series. So guys, I'll share the microsite then in the in the chat, and then I'll read yeah, that. Yeah, and, and maybe we can use it in the email that goes out to everyone too. So guys, what should you, uh, we understand about the business up front? So I've already kind of given some categories like culture, um, you know, the business goals, but what do we want to know? Give me some things that you want to know about a business if we're building a modern, progressive learning stream, a learning experience, or a learning ecosystem. Go ahead and type that in the chat, and I'm interested to hear from you. Okay, we need to know the business vision and mission. You'd be amazed how many companies struggle to articulate that, but yes, and if they don't have it, we need to try to hone in on that. And normally I'll lean on external business pressures to try to get there, right? Current business challenges, yeah. Uh, how the change should impact the business. What are we looking for? Thank you, that's beautiful. Um, product specific goals. Right, so what are we doing for this learning or what are we doing for this learning for this product? Right? Because it, maybe it's just an experience or a specific stream we're going for here rather than a whole ecosystem. Yeah, what's the environment these people operate in? Fantastic. Am I in a, a manufacturing plant or am I um, out there in a branch or am I in a back office somewhere? Am I geographically dispersed? What are the critical business competencies? Have they done this before? Was it successful? Why, why not? Excellent. And here's what's interesting. You may not even have data from that, right? So that actually goes into the decision-making process of how, who, which population we're going to focus on. Um, goals and outcomes they're trying to achieve. Current co co paradigm, right? So what's the learning culture, right? What exactly is happening in learning today? What, what, what resistance might we experience? Understanding the risks. What is it going to take to adapt? Yeah, uh, thank you, Catherine. That's a really good one, right? What is, I, I love that because, you know, banking, obviously, but not just banking. Others are in highly regulated environments. Um, and, you know, there might be instances around the IT or the technology that need to be factored in, you know, GDPR requirements, data security requirements, all of that stuff comes into it. Um, look, there's a whole bunch of stuff and you guys have got it bang on, right? So what, are the, what's, what is the strategy? What are the priorities? What is the level of readiness and maturity, right? What is the desired, the, what, what is the current future state, sorry, and the desired future state slash culture? What are the current systems, KPIs, and processes they're operating with? This is kind of like the environment. Uh, if they don't learn it now, what would happen? Thank you. I think that's a good one, Piata. Um, so, so absolutely, you know, we need to know that language because anyone who's done any type of reading into change management and influence and things like that, environments that we operate in dictate behaviors. So I can have the best learning program and it's actually very effective, but they go back to work and the systems that they operate in aren't set up to, to, to drive that change, then you're in trouble, right? So, so systems, KPIs for mapping and processes in an IT and infrastructure. These are the broad categories. There's a lot more than that. But as I start to understand that, then I can start to do some serious definition, right? So what I'm going to talk about here, and I think hopefully this is something new for you guys, is the, the power of design uh, measurement into the design process, not just in achieving better measurement outcomes, right? The, the a higher capacity to measure ROI. That's definitely what this is about. But also how uh, measurement influences the design process. So imagine now I've, I've, got, I've got my learner personas, I've done my business analysis. Now I'm going to talk about what are we going to measure? And I'm going to use a little case study, a little story of Michael Phelps, right? So we know that Michael Phelps wants to win a gold medal, right? Um, if for those of you who don't know, Michael Phelps wins a lot of, won a lot of gold medals in freestyle and, and butterfly dominant swimmer from the US. Um, normally, you know, you might think, okay, so I'm going to win gold medals. I'm going to go and do a lot of training, right? But how does Michael Phelps know? Like he knows, for example, that he wants to achieve certain times. And if he achieves those certain times, he's going to get into the Olympics and hopefully win a gold medal. What are the indicators that we start to realize that he's on the right path to achieving those times. And then by achieving those times, he's gonna to get to the Olympics and by getting to the Olympics, he's gonna win a gold medal, right? And this is really what we call the measurement map. So the measurement map is a process that looks at, yes, strategic goals. It looks at business results, but then it also maps out the leading indicators, right? So calorie intake, daily diet, resting heart rate, right? Percentage of body fat, work rate, all of these different things come into it. Now, if I just didn't have these leading indicators and I just said, all right, 
business results. Um, and I knew it was one, one minute 45, and that's all I knew about the process. My training plan could be very unfocused and extremely hard to measure. But now, all of a sudden, I realized that, you know what? Calorie, calorie intake is, is important. All of a sudden, I realized that sleep is important. All of a sudden, I realized how many pull-ups, and especially a certain type of pull-up. All of a sudden, I realized all of these things become pertinent. I can then start to build a training program or validate an existing training program against how effectively it is going to achieve the results. So, so that's kind of what I want to get at here is the power of, of, um, of leading indicators in driving design. So I'll move away from an Olympic swimming to um, a sales training. So I want to increase sales, right? That's where I want to get to. That's a common KPI. Now, and I want that to increase our market share and profitability. Now, often they're level three and level four Kirkpatrick measurement areas, right? But how do I know that I'm building the design? So I'm going to work backwards and I'm going to figure out, I want to build a training program. And we've, this is actually a real, it's a, it's, a, it's a dumbed down version, but a real measurement map we built for a large American uh, auto manufacturer, right? What are the first signs that a modern, that any learning, but specifically a modern learning uh, modern digital learning experience are being successful, right? And so we start to map that out before we've even chosen the content, before we've even chosen the duration or the modality, right? Well, we're going to see that this person, we want people to be having more contacts with customers. We want the increase in appointments to be going up. We want product presentation, both the number and effectiveness of percentage of, that go ahead. We want all of this stuff to go ahead. So if I know that, then all of a sudden, I start to think, well, hang on a minute. I was just vetting. I, I just sent out an RFP for, for, for dealership sales training. And everything was focused on dealership sales training soft skills. But now that I've mapped out these leading indicators, all of a sudden, you know what? The sales training soft skills are only going to hit a part of it. Or the soft skills aren't really focused on transferring from, one per, from, from meeting a client to a presentation and from a presentation to a walk around, a vehicle walk around, you know. Or, or, or maybe I realize that I need to have training on the CRM, or I realize I need to actually include a virtual interface to help our salespeople better interact with clients remotely because of COVID-19. You know, so the leading indicators, are, uh, they've blown up, they've, they've, they've completely revolutionized the way that my team designed training, because now I've got, I've got learner personas, I've got my business and map, and on top of that, I have leading indicators that now help me say, what is the right content? You had content in mind, client A or client B, but now that you've done this, is this, client, is this content still the right content or is this framed the right way? And the great thing about leading indicators, it's not just um, performance. Like we did one with Facebook, right? Where we built out leading indicators around the learning culture, right? So we'd already mapped out what is the learning culture and we've done this in multiple clients. What is the learning culture that this organization wants? And in Facebook's case, it wanted a social learning environment. So we built out what are the leading indicators that this experience is not only being affected from a content and business and, and performance perspective, but also that it's being effective in changing our learning culture. So who joined, number of posts, number of posts that other people like, number of posts that other people have posted about, right? So it's not just that someone has posted. If we're finding that people are only posting once and no one's reading their other posts, and no one's commenting and asking questions and interacting with each other, then this is not effective. So we need to change the technology. We need to relook at the scope. Maybe my prototyping, I'm going to start really, really small, and I'm going to prototype something to test how we'll learn and socially engage with each other. So you can build in leading performance indicators for, from a job performance. You can build in leading indicators from a culture perspective. You can build in leading indicators from a learning experience perspective. And once you've mapped all of that out, all of a sudden, you're ready to start doing things like validating your content, right? So here is an example of content we were given when on a real project that's now two years in, they wanted a three-month learning program and they wanted to focus on these three things, self-awareness, interpersonal effectiveness, um, getting future ready for individual contributors in a bank in Asia, right? Look at some of these modules here, design thinking. Well, straight away, before I'd even done the learner personas, I was like, well, what does design thinking mean to a branch teller, right? What does team contribution mean to a compliance person in a bank? What does task management mean to an investment banker, right? So, so all of a sudden, I straight away knew that some of this was going to change. And once we went through the persona, personification process, we did that analysis, 
we realized that actually the focus, what these people really cared about was their careers, right? So getting future ready was really about resilience, right? How can I create a buffer between myself and changes that are coming, right? Um, Self-awareness all of a sudden became, became more about growth mindset, knowing my strengths and how can I deploy them to be more effective. Interpersonal effectiveness became about seeking support from others and, and, and building a network to help me improve my knowledge and, and expand and grow. Right? So that all came on the back of a validation of leading indicators that we want to see. It also came on the back of a learner personas. Other things came out of it. right? So here are some of those categories that I mentioned. We knew from the analysis of the company and the learners and, and, and the measurement that it had to be mobile friendly. We had to be micro learning. They needed it to be social. It had to be multimodality. It needed to be stretched over time because people didn't have enough time. It needed to be cloud-based. We knew that the content, it needed a live kickoff. Why did it need a live kickoff? Because we realized that that, that bank was petrified that if they launch a three-month self-led experience to a population that had only received top-down mandatory learning before in an Asian culture, that they wanted a live kickoff to make sure that we could ease them into it. So we did do live kickoffs for the first four runs. But then after that, we pivoted to virtual kickoffs because the culture had changed. It was no longer necessary. Why spend on travel and venues and live kickoff if it's not necessary, right? So that went away after time. We knew, we knew how much time did these learners have to commit? How many minutes could we accommodate per micro learning activity? How were we going to track progress? Um, and, and then, you know, how are we going to engage them? And all of that fed into the experience and it fed into things like what technology now do we choose? Right, now we know all of this. We know what content is. We know what outcomes we want. We know all of those things. Now we're going to choose the technology. And in this case, because GP is technology agnostic, we work across, we, vet, we test and vet learning technologies and platforms all the time because of our role in managed outsourcing of learning for large organizations. Um, we landed on Intrepid. Right? Intrepid was the right tool and continues to be the right tool for that experience. But for an automotive client, you know, we might be looking at, have I even got it on here? Centrical, right, is another great platform that's really good for the automotive environment. Um, you know, Fuse Universal is powerful for, for, for social and, and, and user-generated learning. Degreed is amazing if you've got a lot of content and content sources and you want to curate that and align it to job skills and, and, and level of Areas and maybe it's a bind of all of them. Yes, we will share recordings. Um, you know, so 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 that's kind of the art of design, right? If I could just summarize quickly, and I'm going to show a couple of little examples before we go to questions. But if I come all the way back here to you know the power of design thinking, why we do this type of design, it's because if you don't do these steps. That, and I'm talking about even if you're doing a classroom training, it's valuable to go through these steps. Then how on earth can you know how to be ruthlessly relevant? How can you know what types of connections to create, how to create them over what scales? How can you know what respecting time looks like? So that example for that bank that I mentioned, this was for the individual contributor population. When we did a similar program, but in the, in the same leadership right by you curriculum, it went down to the manager of managers, so senior leaders, it was one hour per week. So we had, so there were a lot of changes to how, how, how that changed based on that population, right? So yeah, how are we going to be able to respect people's time? And most importantly, how do we know how to pull people in to the learnings, right? You know, all of that is going to feed off your analysis of your learners, off your analysis of your business and those areas, those queries that we spoke, and then this isn't, not all companies do this, but if you've done a powerful measurement mapping process, you can then validate all of your decisions. Put all of that together, and now all of a sudden, those fears that I mentioned that people have, right? I'm worried about going digital because I'm worried no one's going to turn up. I'm worried that it's not going to be the right investment. I'm worried that it's going to miss the mark. If you trust the process and move through that effectively, right, if you're agile and you're flexible and, and you move through that, then you're going to be more likely to get to what good looks like before you even do your pilot, right? That is the essence of good digital design. Um, I kind of want to pause for questions, but I've got you know other examples here of, of you know our hackathons of ideating to, to build low lo-fi prototypes, right? So we build this lo-fi prototype for a large automotive manufacturer. Um, came up with ideas based on all of that feedback. We fleshed them out. We we prioritized them. I'm skipping the prioritization process, and then we actually made it. So sell like we do. We made a quick Facebook page, 
It was super low, pro, low cost. And we created a social dynamic that tested would people post and comment and what would it take to do that? That was like a, a quick trial. That then went on to a, a Fuse Universal type platform, which was a bigger investment, but we knew that it was going to work, right? We have, we have partnerships with chatbots. So we quickly made a chatbot, tested that, right? The chatbot, we did data and testing. Um, we found out that when we did shorter chatbot cycles, that the NPS score was much higher. We found that when we did text not including Sundays, the engagement level was higher. You know, we had did all of this testing and then that arrives you through to a good outcome. So to put it in a nutshell, yes, I know that when you're making these decisions, you want to get to success. And when you're speaking to a vendor like GP or any other vendor out there, you want them to show you everything. Show me what good looks like. Show me the end result. But the reality is what goes into success is a whole bunch of other stuff. You start at the bottom. All right, here's your brief. But then you've got to layer on top of that the culture, the country culture, the company culture, the learning culture. You've got to layer onto that your learner personas. You've got to learn into that those guiding design principles, ruthless relevance, all of that stuff, and your measurement map. And then you go through an agile design process, and that takes you to what good looks like. This is what's been successful for us and our partners. And the reason why I wanted to talk to you about this today is so – I wanted to demystify the process, but also be realistic about what it takes to make good digital learning experiences and also the overall ecosystem that your learners are operating in. So thank you guys. Look, I know I've just gone hammer, hammer and tong there to give you lots of information. I want to pause there for Q&A. Um, so uh, please go into the chat now and uh, hit us with some questions. And on that note, Ben, we, we have a comment from, from Alison. Um, and she says, there is also a change of mindset within organizations who have responsibility for learning. And many don't understand how to design digitally. It's taking everyone on a journey. And I think, um, you know, you touched on that before as involving other stakeholders as well, but often just the learning team themselves, you know, COVID-19 has been a big curveball for a lot of people and push uh, the digital agenda. And um, yeah, I, I just wonder about your thoughts on, on that comment. Look, that's why I showed these quotes at the top, right? That, is, that, the, that gap there that you're referring to is what creates these types of comments from, from our partners, you know? And, and it's honestly part of the genesis why I'm running this webinar series. Look, I'm giving a lot of information here because the more educated the marketplace is, the better I can support, my team can support, the better the partnerships will be. Because there's nothing more frustrating. Honestly, it happens a lot where clients are like, hey, Ben, we want to hit 2,000 learners, but we want to, we can't afford classroom because of COVID-19, right? Um, and, and, but we want it to be engaging. But guess what, Ben? You have to do it 15 people per cohort. Like they're using old thinking and applying it to new outcomes. 15 people per cohort. And, and we want it to still be classroom. And we just want to have a little bit of a blend. And, and I know that that's not going to get them to where they want to go. Right? But until I can educate them on what it takes to get to what good looks like, I will face that challenge. Right? So, so Alison, it's the only way I know to, get to, to, to overcome some of those barriers and help our clients make good decisions is by educating. So I run these in-house. I run these publicly, as we're seeing today. Um, I break down projects you know, to try to show where did it go right, where did it go wrong. Um, we've got some more comments coming in. So Alison, hopefully that answers my perspective on your question. Um, before COVID, the learning preferences have been classroom-based learning as well as long sessions. Once this, however, that has changed, and now learners prefer short and accessible learning sessions. That's really true. And William, I ran a, a session on what our first kind of COVID thriving, not just surviving session was on the most immediate thing our new clients would do, which is take classroom and put it into virtual. So we ran a session on how do you do that well, um, you know. And there's an art to it, even just going into virtual training by itself, one single modality. But you're absolutely right. I mean, that's what businesses want. That's what learners want. Automotive, dealership staff don't want to send their people off the job. Salespeople don't want to be off the job. So how can we meet them where they are? You know, I think that's critical. Um, <laughs> thank you, Catherine. You know, passion comes with the territory, right? Because I get, I get equally frustrated and passionate when things aren't going right as I do when things are going right. So that's where the passion comes from. George, my challenge is going to be to integrate this thinking into a client's existing business model. Look, George, that's the whole point of this process is that's, that's why. So we often run just a partial design thinking session just to start to get a map of what's going on in that business so we can kind of know where do we meet them, right? What's needed 
to, to, to get to what good looks like, or even just to figure out what the first step is. A lot of engagements are not even with a project in mind. They're just, let's figure out, this is true design thinking, what, what's the first step? What, what's the first population we should think about? What's the first topic we should do? And you know, there's two approaches to this. One is the top-down approach, and one is the bottom-up approach. The top-down approach for a company is that they go out, they work out their business mission and strategy and vision for the next 10 or 15 years. Then they work out what learning culture they need, and then they start working from there. Very few companies have the bandwidth and the time and the buy-in from the wider business to do that. Inevitably, what happens is we come in from the bottom up. So we'll pick a, a topic, like it might be a product launch for automotive, or it might be an onboarding training for a bank, or it might be a training for individual contributors, and we'll start with that population first. Do all of this, this rigor to make that a good, amazing experience. And then through that, the business learns from the bottom up what it takes to be successful in their organization. You know, so that's, that's kind of the two approaches there. Um, it's up to you guys to decide where your companies are at. Is it a top down or a bottom up approach? We've got another couple of questions then. Um, uh, Vidalia Rodriguez is asking about um, any insights on cross skill or cross skilling of employees. Um, Vidali, you may need to provide a little bit more um, you know, background on, on that question and exactly what you mean on that. I, you know, I understand cross-skilling as, as taking um, employees that are working in, in one part of the business and cross-skilling them, maybe um, yeah. skilling them up on sales or something like that is quite a common use of, of uh, the, the only way I can interpret that question where I could potentially add some value is around, uh, uh, is around mindset to cross-skill in the first place. So if an organization is coming to me and saying, we need a workforce that is cross-skilled and upskilled, the company doesn't have the money, the budget, the resources to actually individually cross-skill everybody. They may not even have the subject matter expertise to cross-skill everybody in the skills that are needed, right? So it's a huge undertaking. So, you know, when we did the, the banking example that I mentioned, what we end up focusing on, we, we made a module, and it's one of the best modules I've ever, we've ever created, in my opinion, in terms of impact. We made a module that basically lit a fire under their seat, created such urgency and excitement around the need to be agile, the need to cross skill, and then equipping them with some frameworks to, to rethink their, their job, right, where they're at. Um, you know, that's really been powerful. So, you know, growth mindset, a section around growth mindset, getting them to realize where they have a fixed mindset, you know, getting them to discuss that in a discussion forum, watch a video on growth mindset, participate in a poll, you know, do a self-assessment on fixed versus growth mindset. Then map out your strengths. Align that to what your manager says is needed for the job. You know, all these little steps. And what we found that happened out of that module is beautiful. At the end of that course, right, uh, to give you an example, we didn't once talk about switching roles within the bank. We didn't once talk about like presentation skills or conflict management. But on the back of that module around cross, around, you know, being agile, being future ready, the cr critical nature of, of that mindset, pe people had decided things like there was a lady who contacted us. She said, I've decided I want to be a better presenter because she realized in her mind, she's, her fixed mindset was I'm always going to be a bad presenter. I'm a nervous presenter. She realized that was a fixed mindset. She, she went out across that three month program on her own time and went and invested in public speaking courses and stuff like that. And then rang us to say in the, in the capstone event, can I please present? Right? She wanted to put herself to the test. So we didn't touch presentation skills, but we changed their mindset to realize for themselves in their own context, in their own way that's relevant for them, you know, what's required. You know, we had another guy switch from being in GTO, in transaction processing, to investment banking. He always saw himself wanting to be a banker, and he thought he could never do it. He went and made that transition. We didn't touch on that. Right? So, so for me, if you're talking about cross-skilling, mindset comes first. Right? That then creates the culture. Um, and then maybe you can then lead, it would be a better investment afterwards to then start giving skills in cross-skilling. Because if you start offering this cross-skilling skills without the mindset shift, then people don't put the right energy and the time into it. And again, I feel like it could be a waste of investment. That's my two cents, but that, you know, there's a lot of different ways to go. Thank you for sharing um, that, Ben. And, yeah, um, you know, William's got a big one. Yeah, William's got a, 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 good, a good comment here, basically, that um, in his experience, most l and professionals tend to stay on the outside of operations of the company in the business. And this would affect the learning created by L&D team. By deep diving into the operations of the business, understanding their state of service, you'll be able to understand what the real needs are. Hence, learning modules can be targeted, specific, ROI-related, and highly desired by the users of the content frame. 
and and look, I think we we certainly fully agree with this. That um, the, the better you know the business, the better you can serve your business. And yeah. that's really, you know, it's not always that easy for learning professionals, right? To get in on the on the ground floor and you know on the front line. And that's really what a lot of this focus is about doing. Yeah. Um, Let me give an example of, of that yeah, in action. Um, so there's two examples I'll give you of like we're, more and more we're not dealing with the learning team directly, right? Where, so in the automotive space, I'm dealing a lot with the sales and marketing arm, right? Or the after sales team, you know, who, who, uh, who, who they know exactly what they need and they're trying to take them through that process of figuring out how do you be responsive. So all of a sudden now I'm dealing with them. Their pressure points are, you know what, I'm an OEM, I'm, I am X motor company and we've got a huge dealership network, um, you know, and, and those dealerships are franchises. They don't want to pay for training. They don't want people to be off the job. They get frustrated when we do that. So all of a sudden, we start to meet them where they need us, right? Another example would be in a bank. We do a lot of work in the compliance space. Compliance especially, we work with a large global bank. Many banks are suffering regulatory and compliance challenges. Now, we aren't subject matter experts in anti-money laundering and financial crime and credit risk, although I'm becoming one. Um, that Basically, what we've looked at there is, is, is adaptive learning streams where instead of learning being a single event, right, I learn about this year's new uh, reforms or new issues in the compliance space, and then I hope that they remember it for three months, and then there's a breach, and then the regulators are saying, hey, what, what learning have you done? And you say, well, I, they passed that e-learning three months ago. That's not enough anymore. So now we're pop, pop building where there still might be a learning event, but now there's, we're using Area 9, Rapsode, right, to, to pulse out learning continuously to test where people are at, their level of co competence, but their level of conscious or unconscious competence, and then learning being adaptive based on their level of competence, pushing back out to them. So now when there's a breach, the bank can say, hey, you know what? We have been tracking this person every week and they are totally up to date, you know? So we are not responsible, you know? So, so definitely we work with functional leads and that's actually where the magic can happen because you can really get into the learner needs and the business needs at a deeper level. Hopefully that we encourage all learning professionals in an organization to do that and partner as much as they can. Um, now, I'm conscious of the time. We're, we're two minutes over the hour. Uh, we did start three minutes late, so we're, we're bang on time, I'd say, Ben. I'm not, this for, date might uh, change, actually, Oliver, so I'm not going to bring this up because I realize we might be a little bit later with our research. But we do have an upcoming webinar launching our research for the results of business as unusual. Um, ignore that date for now. I think it might still be coming up. Right, um, I'm still yeah. still in the moment plan for the thirtieth, so do hold it in your uh, in your calendar. But um, you can register, and if you do register, if there are any changes to the date, you will be updated. I'll be leading this webinar on um, yeah the the insights from a, a really huge piece of research that we've done on on leadership in the time sort of post COVID. So um, should have some interesting insights. We don't have the, all the data yet, um, so I'm excited to see what it looks like and share with you guys um, what we found. So some, some primary data on leadership in the time of COVID. So I think that would be very useful. And Oliver, I think what we'll do is when we send out the thank you for attending email, whatever it may be, let's include links to the previous webinars in our yeah, series, the, series at, so at, everyone can get those. Yeah, we'll definitely do that. So anybody who's attended this will get those links to our previous webinars. And if you want to reach out and get in touch, my email is up on the screen. Um, we are still offering a 30-minute uh, consultation call. So if any of these topics are important to you and you really want to um, to hear a little bit more about that, so I'm realizing that that's not hyperlinked on people's screen. So I'm just going to tap in my email into the chat. Done. Thank you, Ben. So have I. There we go. hope neither of us have typos in it. So there you go. You can um, connect with us on, on there. Um, yeah, so we're, we're, we'll share with you the, the previous webinars. Um, we do have those 30-minute uh, consulting calls, so you're absolutely welcome. If there's a topic you want to dive into, you can have a one-on-one -on -one call um, in order to find out a little bit more about that topic, ask a few of those questions firsthand. Perhaps there's some elements within your own organization that you don't necessarily want to share publicly, uh, but you do want to get some advice or have a conversation about. Do reach out to me to arrange that. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for the 32 of you who've stuck around uh, till overtime. We really appreciate it. And look, I just hope this is educational and valuable and you can make better decisions moving forward. That's, that's the goal. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. This webinar is brought to you by GP Strategies. 
Together, we can create a world where business excellence makes possibilities achievable. You can access more webinars or download additional resources at gpstrategies.com forward slash resources hyphen library.